We're live, Chairman. Thank you very much indeed. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this meeting of the Public Health and Community Safety Panel on Friday the 11th of June. Um, COVID-19 attendance at this meeting, I need to read out the following announcement that due to the ongoing coronavirus pandemic, the Council will be holding this meeting electronically, but in accordance with the current relevant regulations. Members of the public may also attend this meeting in an electronic capacity, and there is a link on the Council's website for you to do so. Members of this meeting are asked to keep their microphones switched off until called to speak and to switch their microphones off once they have finished speaking. Cameras can be left on throughout the meeting if you wish, um, but if possible, can you at least turn it on if and when you're speaking during the meeting. Uh, to indicate a wish to speak, members should use the raise hand function. Uh, use of the meeting chat function should only be kept for voting purposes. Um, I will check with officers as well um, before I move on to uh, a vote or another item to see if anyone wishes to speak that I may not have seen on the screen in front of me here. So I will double check. Uh, at the end of the debate on each item of business, there will be a vote. Members should vote using the meeting chat function by indicating for, against, or abstain when I prompt you to do so. And I will declare the result after each vote. Uh, there will be comfort breaks uh, built into the meetings uh, of at least 15 minutes if necessary uh, every two hours. Other breaks will be incorporated as appropriate or as indicated the need thereof. Membership changes. Uh, there are none to date. Well, that's a, a good start. Apologies. I also have none today. Are there any apologies I may have missed? No one's indicating. That's good. So what I'm going to do is because this is the first meeting of, of this panel um, since the new uh, um, administration, the new municipal year, and there's been quite some turnaround and a slight renaming as well of the panel itself. Um, shall we um, just go around and, and introduce ourselves? Well, I'll do that. I'd just call out your name and then you can just tell us very briefly who you are and where you're from. Um, so first of all, David Barnard. David Barnard. We'll come back to David. Uh, Sarah Bedford. Sarah, are you there? You're on mute. No, OK, well, Sarah Bedford's on it as well. Judy, Judy, you've got something to say. Judy Billing. Always got something to say. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here. My name is Judy Billing. Uh, I'm representing the Labour group on this new shiny panel and I'm from Hitchin North. Thank you, Judy. John Hale. Oh, good afternoon, Sorry, Chair. Sorry, I was talking away. At... Oh, I'll come back to you in a moment, Sarah. Uh, yes, John Hale. Hi. Okay. Good afternoon, Chair. Uh, John Hale, the County Councillor for Coney Heath and Marshwick, uh, previously on the Community Safety and Waste Management Panel and looking forward to what I think is a good link in bringing public health and community safety together. Thank you, John. Thank you very much indeed. I agree. Sarah, Sarah Bedford. Sorry, I have IT problems, which is why my camera isn't on, um, right. which IT know about, um, which is obviously why I couldn't speak either. Um, Sarah Bedford, Lib Dem County Councillor for Abbots Langley. Um, I was on the public health uh, panel, as it was then, back and localism back in 2013 and did four years then. So I'm looking forward to new minds with public health. Thank you, Sarah. Great to be working with you again. Uh, Ronnie Hearn. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. County Councillor for Sheffield and Bandley Hill, a uh, Conservative member. Uh, this is my first term, so I'm looking forward to uh, hearing all your thoughts. Thank you. Thanks, Ronnie. We'll, we'll help you through. Anything you need, just ask. Thank you. Fiona Hill. Fiona Hill, County Councillor for Royston, Eastern Ermine. I have previously sat on public health, so delighted to be back and was previously on the Community Safety and Waste panel. Thank you, Fiona. Sonny Thusu. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I'm the County Councillor for Haldens, Long Garden City. Um, first time ever been a County Councillor and uh, I'm also a surgeon. Great, thank you, Sonny. And again, you're you're very welcome. Uh, we, we like new members to the council and to panels. Thank you. Uh, Ron Tyndall's next. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Ron Tyndall, Hemel Hempstead, St Paul's. Uh, also uh, a previous member of Public Health. And I also am a opposition lead for adult care services. Thank you, Ron. Good to see you. Uh, Fiona Thompson. 
Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm newly elected County Councillor for Hanside and Pear Tree in Well and Hatfield. Uh, delighted to have been appointed Deputy Cabinet Member for Public Health and Community Safety and Vice Chair of this committee. And I look forward to working with everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. And I can say I'm delighted to have you as the Vice Chair of this uh, of this panel. Uh, we've had so many meetings already uh, in the last week or so. Um, and your contributions have been much appreciated and your experience too. Colette Wyatt-Lowe. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, oh, we've lost you. Try again, Colette. Yeah, thank you. Anybody think I didn't know how to do this? Um, <laughs> Colette Whitelow, um, I've been a county councillor since 2009, representing um, uh, Hem Hem Hemel Hempstead North East or Groveville and Woodall Farm as we all, as we all know it. Um, it's well, an extensive background. I mean, as Jim reminded me this morning, I was the first uh, cabinet member with responsibility for, for public health, but also I've chaired the Health and Wellbeing Board, uh, adult social care, been out of it for two years while I've been chairman. So it's really glad. I'm really glad to get my 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 feet back in the water, as it were, and refresh my memory about all the things I'd, I'd popped while I was doing the other role. Delighted to be with you, Morris. And I think this new configuration is um, has huge potential, uh, you know, for for the county and, uh, and and for delivering services to residents. So thank you. Thank you, Colette. And again, really looking forward to working with you, as I am with all members of this panel. So what is the remit? Well, let's note it. We've noted the membership. Um, so the remit is as follows. Uh, public health, including health protection, health improvement and physical activity, joint strategic needs assessments, early intervention and prevention, Hertfordshire Fire and Rescue Service, trading standards and consumer protection, resilience, emergency planning and community safety, relations with the police and crime commissioner and the constabulary. So item two of the agenda is minutes. Uh, I invite the panel to note the minutes of the public health and prevention cabinet panel meeting, which was held on the 11th of February 2021 and the community safety and waste management cabinet panel meeting held on the 19th of March 2021. If you can just agree via chat then officers will let me know when we can move on. I suppose I better agree myself, hadn't I? Agreed. There we go. I think that's uh, I think that's carried, isn't it? Okay, that's good. Thank you very much. Item three on the agenda: petitions. There are no petitions at today's meeting. So, item four on the agenda is the update from David Lloyd, the Police and Crime Commissioner for Hertfordshire. Delighted that David uh, was recently re-elected, congratulations, um, is here uh, in person today uh, and I'm delighted to hand over the chair and the mic to him uh, just to take us through this item. Thanks so much, Morris. Really good to be back. Um, glad to be working with uh, friends old and new um, on this. I think that the, as many others have said, I think that uh, uh, bringing together uh, community safety and public health is uh, a really positive thing. It actually uh, is not overly different from where we were when I was exec member for uh, community safety and adult care services, which at the time really sort of almost prefigured the public health portfolio. And I think it fits most neatly there and is going to help us work even more more closely together um, uh, and I, I really look forward uh, to doing that so I think it's a really brilliant uh, alignment and I really look forward to, to working closely with you Morris and with uh, the whole of uh, this panel and uh, and uh, as closely as ever with with Jim so I'm, I'm really looking forward to it um, the constabulary has um, uh, recently um, uh, worked through a whole new approach to policing, which is called prevention first. And frankly, that is a sort of public health type agenda to ensure that people don't 
um, uh, become the victims of crime in the first place, a much better place to be. It actually brings in that whole idea of how public health has worked and actually got lessons to learn as well from uh, fire and rescue, where, um, uh, as, as, as you all know, um, the number of house fires has dropped significantly over the last few years. And uh, that's to do with a far broader approach than saying, let's get faster um, fire engines and let's carry more water and rather thinking about what starts the fires in the first place and let's make sure that they're designed out. So, you know, I, I think that there's much to learn from those organisations. The constabulary agrees with me and that's why we're doing uh, prevention first. And I think it prefigures us working even more and ever more closely together. Um, whilst I talk about fire, I think it's a good place for me just to the, the the elephant in the room often around this panel is what's David Lloyd up to with regard to fire governance and I think it's probably just as well to cover off where I see it at the moment just so that uh, there isn't any confusion and we can continue to work as closely as we have and even more closely. Um, I think that if nothing changes nationally we'll continue doing what we've uh, been doing very very successfully for the last couple of years, which is um, if government says, uh, oh, so So government can do three things. Um, it can say, continue as you are, in which case we will. And you'll remember that means that we've got to continue to collaborate, which we will do. We'll continue to make sure that uh, things like uh, joint control rooms are uh, you know, looked at and uh, that we have a joint uh, headquarters and that we do joint training together. And we do all those things which the public would expect us to do to make full and effective use of our resource. So we'll do that. We'll see whether there are opportunities to share fire stations and police stations and do all that. We'll do that. Come what may. Um, if government says, well, you know, it really would be uh, nice for, for uh, uh, there to be a police fire and crime commissioner in Hertfordshire, which is broadly still where they're at, um, uh, I will say, well, actually, if nothing's changed, I think our own way of working is a positive way of working and I'm not going to uh, go through a whole business case to try to uh, change governance. I think that, you know, what we're doing works well. If government says you are mandated, you have to change governance, then we'll get on and change governance across to uh, police and fire commissioner as soon as we can. And we'll just just get on with it in the way that Arpitch is good at getting on with it. I think that, you know, is those are the only three options out there. What that means is um, that uh, uh, I, uh, you know, will continue to be closely involved in everything we're doing. We know that uh, um, collaboration is bigger than just just fire and police. It's about county and uh, other, other county services and police. It's about district services and police. And it's about health and police. And we need to make sure that we continue to do that. And I try and hold the ring around that, as well as the, the whole ring around collaborating across the whole of the criminal justice system. Those are really exciting things to be doing. Uh, and they're exciting because it means that victims of crime uh, get a better service than they otherwise would get. And victims of um, it, being unsafe, if you like. And remember, only 20% of what the police do really is around um, criminality. Most of it is around people feeling unsafe and actually um, being supported. And again, you know, that's working across more than one agency. And I think that we uh, will, will, will need to continue to, to work together on that. Specifically, when you read my um, uh, report, you'll see that there are a number of areas that I'm trying to make sure that we work ever more closely. And I love election campaigns, um, more so when I win than when I lose, I have to say, but I love election campaigns because it gives a real opportunity to find out what the public think and to really be able to see what drives them. And you know what I, I found out this time, what I found out at every single election, which is the public are, issue, are concerned in thematic areas, not specifically in uh, one council or one PCC area. So the things that they talked to me about were um, speeding, uh, fly tipping, uh, problem parking, antisocial behaviour. All of those areas have their solution through joint working and some of the solution comes through 
some of the funds that I've got. And I really encourage you as county councillors to make really good use of the road safety fund, to make really good use of the mobile uh, speeding vans that uh, I have funded, uh, to make uh, really good use and work together around some of those safer streets funds. Uh, there's a new one which has just come out. And the central government always tells you that you've got to have spent uh, some of money they've got um, by March. Um, so you've got eight months to do it for a 12 month program. It's going to be difficult, but we can actually find some oven ready schemes together that we can all work on. And uh, let's do some joint schemes um, so that uh, we're able to uh, um, show uh, the Hertfordshire way uh, works really well. Um, and that uh, by working in, uh, in concert, uh, we give uh, far more than uh, by working um, as separate organisations. So I think that's probably the overview that I've got. Um, happy, as always, to uh, respond, if not answer, to questions. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, the hands are going up fast. Um, I'm not sure if that's because they want to leave the room or not, but uh, hopefully it's for questions. Just before I invite anyone else, can I just clarify something that you said, David? You said that in relation to um, the fire service uh, and what government may or may not mandate us to do, has your um, view as the police commissioner been sought as to what might or should happen to the fire service? From government, that is. Um, we, we often uh, talk about it, and I have been quite... Um, clear that if they want to change um, uh, the governance, they have to tell us that they want the governance changed. Um, and I have said to them exactly what I've said to you, which is if, um, if, they, if they say they want to change, fine. If they think that's the best way of doing it, fine. If they don't say they want to change, they won't get any change. So um, uh, that's, the, that's the response that uh, I gave them as I give you. And just, just to push you slightly on this, um, did you actually say you would prefer it to stay as it was? I didn't. I I didn't offer um, a, a view on that. I said that uh, I've already um, uh, made a business case uh, around changing it, which uh, I have uh, ha had to uh, suspend, and that uh, um, uh, I felt that uh, the approach that we have got. Um, works very, very well indeed. Um, but uh, I haven't said to them it's better or worse. I think it's for them to decide what they want to do. But they do have to tell us what that's going to be. And, and um, if they if they don't, um, you know, I, I think it's very difficult to, to get local agreement because uh, clearly there are um, there's a history of, uh, of of where it currently sits. So if they want change, they've got to mandate it. Thank you, David. I'm going to take um, hands up as I see them uh, and I'll make sure that everyone's got a hand up, gets a chance. So uh, Ron Tyndall is first. Thank you very much. Hello, David. Uh, Hi, Ron. Yeah, uh, 4.6 on page uh, on the agenda, the Beacon Safeguarding Hub. Uh, does the offer of support operate on a basis or is it open to those needing help being able to directly contact the hub? I think I heard, um, do you have to be directed there or can you go direct, um, directly yeah. yourself? Yeah. 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 It, um, can any, anybody dial into it or do, do, you, do you have to contact a local the domestic abuse organisation or a NIDVA or someone like that and be referred onto the hub? You, you can, all Beacon services, you can go directly. You don't have to be um, although they are to support victims of crime, those are people who um, uh, are themselves uh, consider themselves to be victims rather than those who have been, um, if you like, um, proven as uh, victims. Um, so you don't have to have reported the crime in the first place. You can go directly to them. Thanks, David. And just one other little thing at the bottom of page 23 to 24. There's some confusing statistics. It says the uptake of support surpassed expectation with 49% of those contacted accepting onwards assistance. And then it says the typical uptake, uptake rate is 25. I'm not sure I understand what that means. Um, uh, uh, 
I, I specialize in uh, statistics, which are um, uh, difficult to understand, Ron, and uh, 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 that doesn't mean to say I understand them myself. Chris, do you have a, um, Chris is on the line. He might have a specific response, but he might just not. Just those people who are watching it, Chris Grace is the is, um, chief executive for you. That's just to introduce him for those who may not and, know. And, and that's called a hospital pass <laughs> where... Uh, <laughs> Thank you. The, I'm, not, the, I'm not sure that's exactly what it's called, but anyway. The, the 25% is the national uptake of victim services. Ah. Does that so make sense? That, yes, so basically the 49% Hertfordshire, the 25% is lovely. Thank you. That's correct. Thank, thank you for that. Thank you, Chris. Uh, next, um, thank you, Ron. Uh, next is John Hale. Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, hello, David, again. Um, I was very pleased to see in your report that the Road Safety Fund has been um, so well subscribed. As, cause, uh, as you know, I asked about it a couple of meetings ago. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, one of the parish councils in my area has put in a bid and I shall be watching to see what happens. Um, the on the case of road safety, and I was also noticed you mentioned speeding as being one of the issues residents are concerned about. Um, I was just out of interest if you had um, were aware of the, the letter that uh, Detective Chief Superintendent, Superintendent Andy Cox of Lincolnshire Police, who leads on road safety nationally uh, through one of the groups, had recently published calling for more action around road safety, giving the, you know, in, in Hertfordshire, we had an increase in fatalities uh, last year. If you're not familiar with it, I will send you some details, but I just wondered if you were. Uh, no, I'm not familiar, um, but um, uh, what he is uh, talking about is, uh, from what you've said, is a common theme, and uh, clearly road safety is a, is a, is a fairly difficult um, nut to, to crack. Um, I think that um, the use of uh, our road safety cameras will be a, a, a starting point. I know that there's a lot of discussion about whether or not, and it'll you know continue through the term of this um, uh, county council. I'm sure whether or not um, 20 mile an hour zones are brought in. If they are, um, uh, it, the enforcement of them is important, uh, and one might argue that if we manage to enforce the limits as they currently are um, more frequently. Um, that that might in itself um, change attitudes because what we've got to do, and that's why it's a cross um, organization issue, we've got to change the culture so that people don't believe it's OK to um, travel at excess speed everywhere apart from outside their own house. And that is quite a difficult change to make, but I think it's one that we can make. Um, and and uh, in the way that uh, we seem to um, have woken up to sort of climate emergency um, or almost within the last year, I think that we could do the same around how we speed. Um, I always think that if you're looking in the long term, this is something um, which will be um, uh, designed out by technology. Um, so in 20 years time, this won't be an issue. But um, uh, there is a scandal of people dying on the roads who don't need to and um, and being seriously injured and having life changing injuries. And we probably can't wait 20 years to change that. So we need to work to, together to make sure that we change it now. Yeah, as you know, David, there was a serious accident on the edge of my division only a few weeks ago uh, with a fatality. Yeah. Um, one of the things that Andy Cox is calling for is tougher um, penalties for speeding drivers and also a review of the exceptional hardship defence, uh, which I think it, both of, on both of those, I agree very strongly with him. I think it is a scandal the way drivers with 12 points or more continue to drive because, you know, they claim an exceptional hardship. They should have thought about that before they started speeding. But thank you for your response. Yeah, thank you. And um, specifically the fatality um, uh, on St Albans Road, I think is the one that you're talking about. Um, my understanding was, uh, I mean, and, and I think talks to the, um, the difficulty about this whole question. Um, someone was trying a very uh, ridiculous overtaking manoeuvre um, in a very um, narrow space. I suspect whether it was a 20 mile an hour or 30 mile an hour 
um, speed limit um, would have had the same outcome. And so we've got to really think outside the box a little bit. And there's, if you like, um, uh, excess speeds on dual carriageways, which perhaps is of a different order to people driving even potentially within the speed limit, but inappropriately for the road conditions. And that's how we've got to try and change people's um, perception. And it's going to be a really difficult job. I mean, we all talk about it, but trying to change those uh, driver attitudes is going to be really difficult. One of the th things that I'm trying to do is to use um, uh, an organization called Drive Tech to at least um, uh, using the Road Safety Fund to um, uh, at least start training young drivers within the first 12 months about because the the um, and I think the fatality was a, a young driver, young drivers under the age of 25, um, just as young people under the 25, age 25 are most likely to be um, criminals within our uh, society. It's the lack of judgment also transfers through to the way that many drive and actually perhaps proper training in place might change some of that attitude. So, um, you know, there's some work there which we can do as well. Thank you, David. Yeah, I think my daughter has one of these things in her car, which if she if she if she drives well, her insurance is less. Um, yeah. I always think it should be carrot and stick to get people on board, especially the young. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Colette was next. Colette Whitelow. Sorry. That's all right. You're on. Yeah, so I'm having that's better. That's it. Oh, now you've gone silent. Now you've gone mute. Right. Um, 4.4, David, sorry, um, which refers to um, the, the uh, fly shipping fund. It reads, you know, and, and forgive me if I'm you know, not totally au fait with, with this one. Uh, it reads like the money is just being used to clear up after people who are who, who are fly tipping. And I, I wondered if, if there is an element of, of what you're trying to do about um, trying to tackle the mindset uh, with regard to fly tipping, because clearly the more we clear up, people will just say, oh, that, you know, somebody will come along clear up after us. And unless we do, you know, in quotes, if you write this, probably the prevention bit, um, get uh, uh, higher detection rates of um, people who are fly tipping and re really punish them. You know, I know at Borough, we, we if we catch them, we it's many thousands of pounds if they're caught. Could you give us a, a, a view on, on, on what the position is on that, please? Well, the, um, the fly tipping fund, um, I funded out of, um, uh, again, it was a sort of uh, trying to use um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, using uh, POCA money, a Proceeds of Crime Act money, um, which meant that offenders were indirectly paying for this, and that, I thought, made good sense. Um, the, the use of it was that, specifically for that area that neither county nor boroughs seem to pick up, which is um, those unfortunate um, people who have had um, significant problems of fly tipping on their land, but the borough says it's not on public land, so we're not picking it up, and the county says it's not on the highway, so we're not picking it up, and that then leaves um, people out of pocket for no fault of their own, they're victims of a crime, and yet they have to pay for it. Um, in many ways, I think this is um, something which would work better if it were just seen as being part of uh, what boroughs do. You know, we need to work far, far more closely together. But I recognise that boroughs were reluctant to do it because that's not what they're meant to do. And budgets are um, very, very tight. So it was really just to try and make things easier for victims of crime. And as you know, the heart of everything I do is around ensuring that, that A, there are fewer victims of crime and B, where there are victims of crime, that they are supported by us. Um, I think that it's a very fine line. You're quite right. One of the problems, uh, in fact, it's something that we saw in some of the fly tipping um, in Broxbourne, um, was that as soon as you start taking away on a regular basis, the people who are dumping there I think this is a particularly good place because we don't have the queue to get into a <laughs> into an HWRC. We just turn up here, we dump it all here, and within a few days um, it's been moved away. So 
part of what I did was to um, say that, you know, first, first go is a free hit. By the time we get to second, um, you've got to be really target hardening so that people can't continue um, uh, dumping there. And that asks for sharing around that target hardening. So we don't put all the money in for it, but um, we say, look, we'll put some money towards um, the capital cost of perhaps putting um, a fence up so people can't get in or whatever. So, um, you know, uh, I, I think you're quite right to highlight it. There is some difficulty there. Again, everything I'll talk about today probably is about how do we get that culture change? How do we get people to think that it is not uh, okay um, to uh, to to dump waste. And there are some uh, members of the community who seem to think that this is okay. And indeed, um, there are significant, I mean, there are there, there are the people who just um, clear up. Do you remember the days when we used to have ashtrays in cars? Anyway, there used to be, you know, people who just clear out, tip out their ashtrays. Mm -hmm. That isn't really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about especially at the the, the almost organised crime group le level where yeah. you've got some significant um, issues happening where people are making a business out of this. Okay, David, thank you. And I think that um, using POCA to, to to help fund fund the the fly tip fund is is a, is a really good use of 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 of, um, of of that availability of the monies. Thank you. Thank you, Colette. Um, uh, Judy, were you indicating before? Judy? No, maybe not. She was. I wasn't sure if she was giving the because she can get the electric one up. Okay. Um, Fiona. Fiona. Uh, Fiona Thompson is next. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you, David. If I could refer you to four point eight, the countywide stop and search update. And I note the average arrest rate from last year, April last year, was ten point six percent, and the average positive disposal rate is twenty three point four percent. Um, as a, this may be obvious to many members, especially those who've sat on this panel before, but as a, a, a new member and a lay, a lay person, can you explain what you mean by positive disposal, please? Broadly, that means we've got a result. So um, uh, we've found something and then we have either issued a ticket on the back of it or we have um, they have gone off to um, uh, court on the back of it. Um, I think that we've got, there are two issues that come out of stop and search at the moment, and we've really got to get underneath. Um, and it goes to what, one of the things that I'm really interested in us to try and get right over the next term. I'm, I'm really working very hard on um, public confidence in policing and, um, and, the, um, and public perception of fairness in policing. And I use those two terms before I talk about diversity, but they're all linked. And stop and search is one of the most difficult areas that we have um, because uh, there is a disproportionate um, use of uh, stop and search, especially um, amongst uh, our black, um, the, the, the black community. Um, and uh, that is shown, uh, and there's an annual report will come to my police and crime panel, which I think you'll be sitting on, you'll be able to see, uh, that will be shown in that annual report. Um, the, the disproportionality of stop is, um, uh, is justified um, because um, those people who are most likely to die on the streets of Hertfordshire and certainly in uh, the metropolitan area in London are young black males and they are most likely to have been killed by young black males who are ca carrying knives. And so we've got a real difficulty about ensuring that we protect all members of our community well without being um, racist in terms of how we do that. And that's a really difficult um, approach. And I try to um, ensure that in Hertfordshire, we um, record closely who is being stopped and that we have an independent panel to review um, and a diverse panel to review how those stops occur and to find out whether or not um, they're appropriate. The fact that the number of um, uh, that we're down to 10.6% as an arrest rate is frankly disappointing because if you're stopping someone and searching them, you are likely to be stopping and searching them for something which would lead 
to an arrest. So nine out of 10 currently are not being stopped um, uh, to that extent appropriately if, if the outcome is to lead to an arrest. Although it might still be a reasonable policing approach to take, one which um, allows people to think, um, if I go out on the street with a knife, there is a good likelihood that I will be stopped and arrested for it. So it's really complex, um, but it's it's something which uh, we need to uh, keep working on. We need to keep reporting. I need to be kept to held to account on how it's happening, and I need to keep the chief constable held to account on what we're doing so that we can continue to justify its use. Thank you, David. I think you're absolutely right, and it's. It's of great concern to residents, and I, I would hope that you're able to work with community leaders um, to enable, you know, this to be addressed. And I suppose it's more about education and obviously prevention. And the more we can work together to to support the police on this, I think, you know, that can only be a good thing. Yeah, it's an interesting one, this one, because there's there's a de deterrent element as well. But how do you measure whether or not you've deterred someone by stopping them on the occasion. How do you do that? And I would be worried if the only reason for stopping someone is because you think you're going to nip them for something. Whereas if you stop someone and it acts as a deterrent, and hopefully it has, it has a longer effect further down the line. So, um, but it's not tangible. So um, that's interesting. Um, I, I am aware we have a very long agenda. I know that Ron has just put his hand up again. I don't want to be going round again. So Ron, I will on this occasion just let you come back. But then I do want to move on um, um, to, 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 to other items. So go on, Ron, back to you. Thank you, Maurice. Very briefly, David, you mentioned in the, your point uh, to uh, collect about fly tipping fund, about repeat offenders going back to favourite places. I just wondered whether your fund actually was able to fund uh, the erection of closed circuit television, uh, CCTV, in order to monitor the activities in a particular place so that prosecutions could then flow, which would actually meet Colette's point. Um, I'm trying to think if we actually have ever done so, um, but there are, I can think of no reason why not, other than very often, as, as you'll know, um, uh, and I can think of points in, uh, in decorum, which we both know and love well, um, uh, where the use of um, CCTV is not easy because of the location. Um, and so it doesn't always, it's not always a, a straightforward um, use, but um, I'm very happy to, uh, to consider that. Um, clearly, I'm not, you know, I, I, you know, I haven't said today, I, I don't do operational. So thank you for allowing me the opportunity, Ron. But, you know, broadly, I'm happy to um, uh, entertain any any bids around it if people say this is something which we can do together. Um, uh, but uh, I leave it for others to decide whether or not the, the operational impact of it is worth having. Thank you very much, David, and thank you, Maurice. That's a pleasure. Um, look, I think we have to be realistic about that, that it, unless I'm very much mistaken, if you put up CCTV, you have to put a sign up saying you're putting up CCTV, which then acts as a deterrent for people who are saying, well, there's CCTV there. Or if they know there isn't, they'll use it again or they'll go somewhere else. It's a huge issue. It's a huge issue for all of us across Hertfordshire, and we do work together. Uh, across the tiers and with the police commission, we need to continue to do so. At the end of the day, it's antisocial, it's criminal, and it can be uh, public health uh, as well, depending on what's being dumped. And uh, we need to do everything we can to stop this. Um, so thank you very much indeed. David, thank you for coming along this afternoon. Thank I really you. Appreciate it. And in, uh, in, you again. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. I tend to dip out. We will discuss whether or not um, to uh, Judy's um, original point uh, before the meeting, whether or not I stay for the whole meeting. Let's discuss that another day. Um, I'm not staying for the whole of this one, um, but uh, I, I suppose one's got to uh, um, balance the fact that I'm not a county councillor um, against the fact that uh, clearly I want to work closely with you and make sure that uh, we're all um, uh, working uh, alongside each other. So real pleasure to be here. Uh, and uh, you, you were talking about uh, CCTV. I see that Ripper is your next report. So uh, you'll, um, uh, you'll be able to get into, uh, in, into that um, quite closely. But really, really good to, uh, to, to be back and glad to be working alongside you. Thanks, Thanks very much. Have, have a good weekend. So we move over now to um, item five.
the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, RIPA. For those of you who are new to this, you will have obviously heard about these types of things on line of duty recently. All of a sudden, everyone knows about RIPA and CHIS and all that kind of stuff. Everyone's very excited by it. So um, it's interesting to note, though, what we do as a, as a local authority, as a county council. And I'm going to invite Andrew Butler, who's the Assistant Director of Community Protection, to take us through this report. Over to you, Andrew. Sorry, Thank you, Maura. Sorry, Chairman, what, you, you need to uh, agree the last item. I do apologise. I'm going to now reverse <laughs> to go back, and um, and I've got to, we've got to note. So we're, we're noting the reports. So I was just noting, aren't we? So do we have to note it in um, in chat? Yes, so yes, please, I, Chairman. Can I, can I ask all members, please, just to note the report? We're not for or against or abstaining. We're just noting David Lloyd Police Commissioner's report. Thank you. Noted. Thank you very much indeed, everyone. Um, it's not because it's a Friday afternoon. I'm not trying to rush it. It's just it's getting getting used to all this different technology. So, OK, Andrew, the Assistant Director of Community Protection will take us through item five. Over to you. Thank you, Chair. You've, you've already stolen my line of duty joke, so I, I, won't, I, won't make it, I won't make any further line of duty references. Um, so members of the previous uh, community safety panel will recall that we're required to bring an annual report to members in terms of our use of RIPA or Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act as, uh, to give it its full title. So um, RIPA is there really to make sure that individuals' rights are protected but at the same time allowing law enforcement bodies, whether that's the police or whether that's people up training standards to, to, to do their job. Uh, and it's about making sure that when we, we do do certain activities, such as surveillance, that we do it in a way that is both necessary uh, and proportionate. So as you can imagine, there were quite strong uh, safeguards in place uh, in HGC and, and more widely. Whenever we do any of these sorts of activities, uh, we have an internal approval process for, by a senior manager, but then often it'll also be approved by the courts as well. So we've got those safeguards in place to make sure that we're, that we're using them appropriately. So um, th this report and the attached policies are going on to cabinet um, next month. And the report highlights really the three, the three main tools that we might use as a law enforcement body. The, the first of those uh, as, uh, as as referenced in the previous item, is directed surveillance. So as a local authority, we've only used that power three times in the last year, uh, all by training standards. And it's only really used uh, by training standards uh, in, in situations where maybe we need to carry out covert test purchases. So the, the most uh, frequent example is where we uh, deal with age-restricted products. So we use underage volunteers to attempt to purchase age-restricted products. And then they have a covert camera on them to, to capture the evidence of that sale. So that, that was used three times in the last year. Uh, the second tool we have is a CHIS or a covert human intelligence source. Um, we generally don't use that uh, tool, uh, but there is the potential if, for example, we use a member of staff or maybe a volunteer to frequently visit a business premise to build up a relationship. Um, so, so, for example, uh, a shop that might only sell illegal tobacco to somebody that they know. Uh, and then the third tool we, we have access to is uh, communications data. So this is things like mobile phone or email records. Uh, we're not allowed as a local authority to view the content of those communications, but we can often get information about the subscriber or the account. Uh, we've used that uh, as a local authority 26 times in the last year, uh, all trading standards or by the shared anti-fraud service. So again, to give an example, we might use that where we're tracking down a road trader and all we have is a mobile phone number uh, and equally colleagues in SAFs will use it uh, when uh, tackling fraud against HCC or our partners. So the report highlights that overall our use of these tools is broadly similar to previous years. Uh, there's only really quite minor changes to the three policies that you'll see there. Uh, and hopefully you'll see that as a local authority, we are only using these powers where it's necessary and proportionate. We're not using it for more uh, trivial matters. Um, but I think it's important to say that it is a really important tool. Uh, and without it, we wouldn't be able to properly investigate uh, offenders. Uh, just a final thing to mention before I finish, uh, the report also highlights uh, a change in the law in the last year. So uh, fire and rescue services uh, can no longer access communications data with the exception of the one hour uh, following an emergency incident, uh, but we don't believe that's going to have any uh, significant impact on the service. 
So uh, I think that's what I was going to say, Chair. Happy to take any questions. Uh, Andrew, first of all, is it worth, um, is it, is it then looking at the numbers, is this down to the fact that over the last 12 months, there would have been a lot less um, investigatory work going on because of lockdown and so on? So so the, the numbers are not really comparable with previous years. Would we be doing more if, if most people hadn't been stuck in for seven or eight, nine months? Uh, possibly, although well, I think the numbers overall are broadly similar with the previous year. So because we're only using these powers for the more serious offences, We've, of course, continued to investigate those serious offences over the last year. So usage is broadly the same. Uh, probably the only real change is over the last 12 months, we've done very little in the way of um, testing off licences in terms of age restricted sales because staff have been redeployed to sort of COVID enforcement work. But that's something that um, I know, you know, uh, just in the next month, we'll be doing, doing a bit more of that work and uh, looking to, uh, to do more in that area. OK, thank you for that. I'm going to open it up to members, but I have got Daryl Keane, Chief Officer, uh, indicating to speak also. So maybe he wishes to add something and then I'll open it up to members. Daryl? Yeah, just very briefly, really, it's just to, to pick up on that point you just raised. I think it's more the nature of the investigations that have been going on that's changed rather than the, the quantity. And in fact, uh, and uh, Andy's probably not singing the Traded Standards team's trumpet sufficiently actually they have been really really busy through covid but um, both for covid related activities and normal investigation so uh, the trading standards team has done a cracking job throughout the last year managing to continue with business as usual and protect consumers in hertfordshire so yeah thank just wanted to say that thank you uh, i appreciate that Darryl. thank you very much indeed uh john hale was first um, I really just wanted Andrew to clarify something to do with the covert activities. Um, he, there, there were three, three of them during the year, and in, in his description of what sort of activities they are, Andrew referred to the use of young people to do this, for instance, age-related offences. But my understanding is that none of no young people were used this year. It wasn't age-related offences that it was used for. Just wanted to confirm that. that, that that's quite correct. So traditionally, that would be our main use of that tool. Uh, but you're quite right. In the last year. Uh, there were three applications and they didn't relate to that to that area of work. Uh, thank you very much for that. It's a good, good question. Thank you, John. Uh, Colette was next. That's it. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Andrew, you referred to uh, minor changes, uh, which we're you know looking at. Um, what impact, if any, do you think those minor changes are going to have on the service that you deliver? Uh, the short answer is, is, is absolutely none, really. Um, so we are required to refresh the policies every year. Uh, they're very minor changes. Uh, one is around the Fire Rescue Service access to communications data and the change, the change there. Uh, one is just to change the name of the regulatory body that oversees this work. Um, and I think the other was just change of uh, uh, internal terminology that we use. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I'm not seeing uh, a, a, any other hands. I, I am grateful. It's a very detailed report. And as I say, I know well, historically, but also in more recent times of the excellent work you guys do. Um, this system is used only when appropriate. It's not used as a snooper's charter, as some people accuse it of being. And we are grateful for the work and uh, to continuing behind the scenes to try and keep our people uh, as safe as possible. Um, Panela asked if you look at the recommendations to note and comment on the content of this report, which we've done. Uh, to recommend to Cabinet that we approve the policies in relation to A, the Directed Surveillance and Covert Human Intelligence Sources, known as CHIS, attached to Appendix A to the report, B, acquisition and disclosure of communications data from communication service providers, which is attached to Appendix B, and the use of social media in investigations attached at Appendix C. Um, can I ask then if you are going to chat and, and if you are prepared to, for, if you agree or disagree, for, against or abstain, please? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. No, we got there ahead of right. We got there ahead of <laughs> we got there ahead of officers, but that's fine. You could just work back, Stephanie. Yeah, is that okay, Stephanie? Don't say no. So I'm assuming that's okay. Um, so Andrew, thank you very much, and Daryl also for interjecting. Um, I think we might just have a. We might, yes, we've got time to get another report in before we need to have a a little five minute break. So um, 
I'm very happy for us to move on to Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary and Fire and Rescue Services, the HMIC FRS Action Plan Update Report, to be presented by John Bolter. John? Uh, Chair, Chairman, if I may, just to introduce, is that okay? Yes, please. Yes, Dal, thank, thank you. you. So, uh, obviously, introduce John, but uh, John will introduce himself in a second. Firstly, just to say that uh, this report, um, I think, is a very positive one for the um, service and for the County Council um, and demonstrates how well we've done in terms of moving on uh, with the actions that came out of the last report. Um, the main piece I would wanted to highlight was that actually we have been slowly moved back in each of the tranches. So in traditional, uh, in tr normal tradition uh, would be that you would remain once um, uh, in the inspectorate, inspectorate's um, um, uh, uh, inspection process, you would stay in the same tranche each each time round. We were in the first tranche for the first set of inspections. Um, we were told quite early on when the next round were, uh, was announced that we would move back into the second round because they wanted to move higher risk services forwards in the process. We've sub subsequently been moved back a further step to the third tranche. Uh, again, which uh, demonstrates that actually the inspectorate doesn't feel that Hertfordshire Fire Rescue Service is high risk. And in fact, it's been suggested to me that uh, they see us as a service that performed well in the last inspection round. So that's very positive. And I think John is going to give uh, a, a good um, assessment now of the um, work we've done to um, pick up the actions from the last report. So over to you, John. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Um, and good, good afternoon afternoon panel. So yeah, the, the fairly short report, but one that has been coming to panel um, uh, at regular intervals um, since the publication of the inspection report in the autumn of 2018. Um, so this is providing you with a six monthly update on how we're faring in progressing uh, across that uh, range of recommendations. Um, you'll see from the port uh, the report that we're making uh, good progress um, on several fronts um, but uh, as in many walks of life uh, this last uh, year or so um, COVID has had an impact on us being able to make some of the progress we would have otherwise have liked to have made um, that comes across on several fronts um, touching in technology um, touching in resourcing and priority, but also in some of the community engagement work which we would have otherwise expected to have made uh, in this last year. Um, something that's much more challenging um, when we've got communities in lockdown, um, although we do have plans now to um, start to revive that um, as and when we can. Um, you'll see also that um, some of uh, that so, um, where progress hasn't been as favourable as we would have liked um, is, is again linked to technology um, and uh, I don't think we'll the only ones where um, technology has um, hasn't quite um, uh, gone as planned uh, some of that frankly has been with uh, in the hands of the provider rather than actually in terms of uh, our own staff in, in the delivery of it Having said that, though, um, we do have some positive uh, news around um, introduction of, of new IT and um, some very favourable reports we've had um, of late from SIAS in terms of the robustness of our IT systems and cybersecurity uh, penetration testing um, and the introduction of new technology such as um, GARTAN and uh, Alertus, which will help us have a much better uh, uh, understanding around resource availability for our on-call uh, staff. Um, uh, in short, um, uh, you know, a, a positive uh, um, report. We will be coming back um, in the autumn. Um, the Chief has already alluded to the timelines which uh, are in place now as we prepare for our next inspection. I think it's equally important to uh, reassure uh, the panel that um, we're not just focusing our efforts on addressing uh, recommendations or trying to fight the last campaign, if you like. Um, uh, considerable effort goes on um, across the service um, with that ethos of service improvement. It's what we would be doing anyway, frankly, um, and uh, we'll continue to do that uh, and we will start to gear up slightly more formally uh, in terms of preparations for 
for an inspection um, when we get into the autumn. Um, I myself, have, we've just had a, a new um, service liaison officer appointed by HMI CFRS. Um, that'll be the fifth uh, one I've had dealings with in the space of the last two years. So uh, their attrition rate um, uh, <laughs> isn't terribly high, but we've um, already established good links uh, with our new SSL. In fact, I've already given him details of this session today and uh, provided the opportunity for him to, to watch on YouTube uh, at his leisure um, and see um, not only the progress that we're reporting on uh, with HMI CFRS, but also on the uh, IRMP, but also one of those important aspects of governance in how we work with our members um, to um, keep them briefed and for them to provide the appropriate um, levels of challenge and scrutiny. John, thank you very much indeed for that whistle stop tour. Can I just ask you under 5.1 when it says no, file in, no financial implications, is that because um, everything that's being undertaken is already budgeted for? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Colette was first off the mark again here. You're doing well. Right. Colette. Thank you, Chairman. Hi, John. John, um, you, you referred to um, um, the delayed and um, being behind schedule um, issues with regard to trying to sort out uh, some of the things in the, in the spreadsheet. Um, I mean, could you give an, as an example of the, you know, you refer to technical problems, of the type of um, problem which has inhibited uh, remedial action being taken? You know, yeah, in, so in, um, perhaps I can, okay, so perhaps I can give you two, two examples, uh, Colette. The firstly actually isn't a technological one, but a resourcing one. So as Simon uh, to who will talk about shortly. Um, um, the fire cover review was one of the uh, important um, platforms of our new IRMP. That was also something that the HMI were encouraging us to progress. Um, that's a huge uh, effort that goes into producing that fire cover review and, and gathering all the data we possibly can. Now we've worked very closely with colleagues uh, in the county council um, to trying to gather all that um, community intelligence and uh, break down profiles of communities. Um, but actually last summer, much of that team were themselves engaged supporting the COVID effort and Operation Shield, for example. So we just didn't have that resource available to then pull that data together. That happened in the autumn and now we're in a much stronger <laughs> position, as you'll hear from Simon, in terms of the fire cover review. Um, in terms of technology, um, uh, I think probably the best example is our um, seed risk information. Uh, so this is uh, uh, risk information that sits on the mobile data terminals, which our firefighters will have uh, on the appliance. Um, now, what we're looking to do is improve the current system. It's not a broken system and it provides some reassurance to a panel on that. Our firefighters do have access to risk information, but a new development uh, with a new product called uh, Seed Risk Management uh, um, hasn't come forward as quickly as we would have liked. Some of that um, has come from Seed, the provider, and their own resourcing issues because of COVID meant that they haven't been able to put some of the resource that we would otherwise have expected to have in terms of the implementation onto our MDT platforms. Thank you. And, and and just that bit of information really sort of puts flesh on the bones, if you like, of so, or perhaps a report which could seem a little bit dry to those not intimately involved like you and Daryl. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Colette. Uh, next, it's over to John. John Hale. Uh, thank you, Maurice. Actually, um, John's good answer to Colette covered most of the points I wanted to raise. And I just really wanted to say, having watched this over the last couple of years, um, whilst the IT and one of COVID have delayed things, I think it's a, a good achievement that they've managed to get it to this stage at this time. Great. Thank you very much indeed for that. I'm always happy to take other people's comments as well. Currently, the top five chart is Colette Whitelow's Ask Three, John Hale Three, <laughs> Ron, Ron Tim, they'll manage to do one and sneak an extra one in, and Fiona Thompson one. So if you do want to speak, I'll give you preference, but not necessarily. Oh, Fiona Thompson, she's now climbing up the ladder again. Fiona. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Pure coincidence. Um, I just wanted to pick up on, on Daryl's point, really. It's quite reassuring, as I've mentioned earlier, this is new to me, um, this this um, directorate, but actually it's very reassuring that Hertfordshire Fire and Rescue is considered to be low risk in terms of inspections. 
Um, and, you know, I'm sure that's down to the huge amount of work carried out over the last few years. And um, I think, as we know, Daryl, you will be handing over the mantle um, and I hope we can continue um, to to be viewed in this way. It's very reassuring for residents to know that actually Hertfordshire Fire and Rescue are doing such a good job. So thank you on behalf of residents. Thank you, Daryl. On mute. There had to be somebody, didn't there? <laughs> Thanks. So thank you to Councillor Thompson for that for those comments. I think um, yeah, uh, Hertfordshire Fire and Rescue Service being being uh, considered low risk, I think it is positive for the for the people of Hertfordshire, and that and that's that's very good. I will certainly be looking for it uh, with interest, uh, you know, after I finish with the service, um, as to how we we perform. I think. Certainly, when you look at the progress that's been made, as John has mentioned there, we've been on a, a, um, a process of continuous improvement. And that, as any organisation should be doing, um, is, is uh, you know, positive. Um, and, uh, you know, very pleased to hear Councillor Hale's comments as well around the journey he's seen us take. I think there are some really important areas where uh, uh, Hertfordshire Fire and Rescue Service has progressed significantly. I'm particularly pleased with how we've moved in terms of diversity and inclusion, for example, and the way we've supported our, our, um, our you know, uh, uh, underrepresented communities, both in our response, um, our preventative activities, but also in attracting them into joining the service. So that that's really good. And there are a number of other areas where we can show significant uh, benefits. I think also um, some of the support we've given to our partners. So we have um, since the inspectorate last came to see us, we have gone live with across the piece across the consortium for our East Coast consortium control room system. So we've now got four services working in partnership. That's Humberside, Lincolnshire, Norfolk and ourselves. We're the lead authority for that. So that, that gives us, I think, an extra QDOS point, if you like, in terms of HMI CFRS. Um, but the really positive aspect is the benefits we've seen with things like the response to COVID, where if we have an outbreak in our, our control room and we have faced that, we've been able to uh, ensure that the uh, people of Hertfordshire have had no impact at all on their emergency response because we've been able to um, either support or get support from other agencies really quickly. So there's lots of examples of that. So it's great to hear that, you know, it's it's reassuring for you and very positive that Councillor Hale's seen that, that journey of improvement as well. So that, that's really positive. Thank you. John? John yeah, thank you. Yeah, th thank you, Morris. I, I just thought um, um, just occurred to me as we have uh, a number of new members on the panel. Of course, we um, have had uh, HMI see who came in in the autumn last year and did an inspection about COVID actually uh, and the response that the fire service and our own contribution to the COVID response. So um, some members will be aware that actually that came back a very favourable report. Um, uh, and also um, uh, highlighted the benefits that um, we were enjoying as being part of the county council and uh, and um, how, how we were able to contribute um, uh, to that multi-agency response. Um, it's not part of this report, it was a separate report, but uh, I think it's worth um, um, reminding uh, members that uh, we've already had recent visit and it's been a very positive outcome on that front too. Uh, John, I'm, I'm very grateful uh, to that. I'm grateful to Daryl and to all the comments that have been made. Look, we know we live in an age of anti-social media, um, armchair critics and keyboard warriors. And I do think it's important that when we have a service that we um, should be proud of, we should sing our achievements. Always room for progress. We can see that and officers will work to progress. But it's important that we are proud of our service and the ongoing efforts that are being made, particularly around diversity, to ensure um, not that we're doing it because just because we have to, but because we really want to. It's a real step change. Uh, and uh, I'm very grateful for all of all of the efforts that are being made behind the scenes to make sure that we that we do make it a service that we can be proud of. Colleagues, the recommendation is that panel are asked to note the content of the HMI CFRS Action Plan 2020-21, attached as Appendix E to this report, and provide officers with comments or observations. We've done the comments or observations, so but you can you in the chat put noted if you're happy to note. Thank you very much.
Any more for any more? Uh, I'm probably going to be told that we should take some kind of comfort break now. Um, it only has to be a quick one. Um, the quicker we get back, the quicker we get on, and the quicker we get out. So, um, um, so can can we say is five minutes okay? Do, do I is that a, keeping the rules? Five minutes and back again at ten past. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.
not live yet. Okay. Everyone's got recharged cups and glasses, I assume. I've just got a very cold cup of tea here. <laughs> very cold. We're live. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Thank you very much indeed for coming back to the second part of this meeting. We're now on to item seven, the Integrated Risk Management Plan Progress Report. And I'm pleased to invite Simon Tuhill, who's the Area Commander, to present this report. Over to you, Simon. Uh, Chairman, if, if I may, just very briefly, just to dive in, is that okay? Yeah, that, that's absolutely fine, Dowell. You did, listen, it's Dowell's last meeting. I'm going to say something at the end, but because it's your last meeting, <laughs> I'm prepared to give you whatever latitude it is that you want, um, just to keep coming in. So, yeah, please do. Thanks, Chairman. So, um, just to confirm, there is a very strong linkage between the last report that we took around HMI CFRS, the Inspectorate report, and this one. Um, as uh, John said, we uh, we aren't doing the things we're doing uh, in response to HMI CFRS just because uh, we need to do them for the inspectorate. We're doing them because they are the right things to be doing as well. And and you very much picked that picked up on that, Chairman, around the diversity and inclusion piece. They are the right things to be doing. And so uh, this report is very much about the uh, continuing those right things and continuing to deliver the. Uh, integrated risk management plan, which is the guiding overall strategy uh, for uh, transition uh, of the service uh, and, and development going forward. So we've made some, pro again, good progress here, which I think will again stand us in good stead when the inspector comes back uh, in 2022. But um, as picked up by Councillor Thompson and Councillor Hale, this is good progress as well. Uh, and so without any further ado, I'll hand over to, to Simon to give it a bit more detail around what, what we've been doing and what the future phases uh, bring for us. Thank you, Dale. Over to you, Simon. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, uh, colleagues, councillors. Uh, so this report is, uh, as uh, Daryl mentioned, uh, uh, an update on the Integrated Risk Management Plan progress, our IRMP. Uh, the RMP was published in 2019 and it has a four year life cycle. As you'll be able to see from the infographic on page one, we've split down the seven proposals within the IRMP into three phases uh, and one further proposal that will be running throughout the lifespan. So what I propose to do is just uh, briefly touch on each phase and the progress within uh, and provide an update. Uh, so phase one um, contained proposals two and six. Uh, they were largely linked to um, investment in prevention, protection and training within the service. That phase is now largely complete, um, subject to continual monitoring. So I'm not going to cover any more on that phase here now, other than probably just to note, worthy of note is around the um, commitment of HCC to redevelop Jessa. Uh, so that will provide Hertfordshire Fire and Rescue. Simon, and just for those just for those who are watching it outside, who may not know what Jessa is, best not to speak in the letters. Thank you, Chair. Yes, Joint Emergency Service Academy. Uh, that um, uh, the PCC referred to earlier on, I think. So that's our training centre, uh, training and development centre based in Stevenage. Um, so uh, HCC commitment uh, to that is, is a substantial financial commitment to provide a, a new operational training building uh, and we'll also go to address both of these um, proposals in terms of directly improving uh, firefighter safety. Um, phase two uh, is examining the risk within the county and how we propose to mitigate against it in various ways. So the first proposal in phase two, uh, and as the uh, chief officer mentioned, was a delivery of a fire cover review, uh, and also John Bolton mentioned that as well. That is a very detailed and uh, large, rich uh, document with lots of data compiled from all of the incidents that uh, Hertfordshire Fire and Rescue has attended over the last seven years. It also, though, considers what our future risk will look like and attempts to consider where our, where our resources need to be placed to mitigate against that. So population growth, demographic changes. It, it also looks at uh, our fire engines and where they're placed uh, and are they suitably placed to respond in a timely fashion 
uh, per the um, commitments we make in our IRMP. Uh, and for those areas in Hertfordshire where we can't meet our attendance times, and there are some very rural areas where we can't get a fire engine there as quickly as our, as our RMP commitment, it then examines what we're going to do to mitigate against that risk. So that document's now produced, it's going through our internal uh, governance processes as, as we speak. Uh, the second part of the fire cover review considers provision of our specialist assets and capabilities within the county uh, and just make sure that they're matched against previous and anticipated demands. Uh, so to put some flesh on the bones of that one, it's um, assets such as fire engines with a big tall ladder uh, and water rescue provision and, and, and those similar type of non fire engine type um, assets. The second uh, uh, proposal is around uh, alternative vehicle trials. So um, I, there has been some delay in progressing this because of COVID. So there's been some delay in uh, our ability to do some of the research and development into the vehicles that are available and that are being used in other fire rescue services simply because we weren't able to travel around the county to view uh, the country to view them. Um, the good news is we have now placed an order for the two vehicles. Those two vehicles are the RRE, RRV, which is the Rapid Response Vehicle, and that will be based at Watford Fire Station. That is a much smaller vehicle uh, that will be able to get uh, to places a bit quicker because it carries less equipment. Uh, the procurement order for that has been placed with a supplier up in uh, Scotland. Uh, they've been suffering their own delays due to COVID in terms of sourcing various vehicle parts. So we're thinking that uh, they will be delivering the vehicle towards the end of the year for it to then uh, the trial, the formal trial to start. The second uh, alternative vehicle that we are trialling is the IRV, which is the Intermediate Response Vehicle. Uh, that's proposed to be based at Berkhamsted for the period of the trial, Berkhamsted Fire Station. That is very similar to existing fire engines. It looks exactly like uh, uh, what you would consider a classic fire engine. It's just a bit smaller in terms of width, length uh, and weight. Uh, and so we're really interested to understand if that helps get to more the more rural parts of the county in a more effective way. Uh, the, the procurement for that is going through the HCC guidelines and rules now with, a, with an anticipation that we'll be able to place the order very soon and again, the vehicle will be with us by the end of the year to actually start the, the formal trial. Um, the good news from our point of view is that the lack of having the of having vehicles, the physical vehicles, hasn't stopped us already starting to gather data around equipment usage at those two stations, Watford and Berkhamsted. So we've got some new IT and at the moment the crews are recording every time they attend an incident what items of equipment they use. And so that's allowing us to build a really rich picture of the items of equipment that get used most frequently and therefore we will want to stow on the slightly smaller fire engines and those bits of equipment that maybe are not needed all of the time. And in addition, because we're going to be running this throughout the year, there will probably be uh, variations in the equipment required in the summer versus the winter. So as an example, in the summer, they may have a water backpack which they can wear to put grass fires out at. Uh, in the winter, they may have chimney rods, which we may use to put out chimney fires. And so we can then understand which bits of equipment we want to carry on those fire engines so that when the uh, when the uh, vehicles actually arrive in service, we hit the ground running for the formal trial. Uh, the phase three proposals are those that link uh, crewing uh, and work patterns. Um, so proposal four is around altering the crewing on our standard fire appliances from five to four. That work's still in um, concept and preparation stage. Um, we're carrying out risk assessments and speaking to other fire rescue services who have already undertaken this. Um, it's worthy of note that actually for the last uh, year, 18 months throughout the pandemic, we've already been riding with four firefighters on our fire engines as, uh, to assist in social distancing. So it, um, in some ways that the concept has been running for the, for the last year and a, and a bit with no negative impacts uh, recorded. Uh, the second area is uh, consideration around altering work patterns. So there's currently proposals that are progressing through our internal governance uh, and consultation around the managerial roles for our station and group commanders um, to improve their uh, 
efficiency and effectiveness, and then to consider the shift systems that they work to continue to deliver um, suitable coverage 24 seven. So that, that works uh, ongoing at the moment and is an internal consultation stage. Um, the final proposal is around the on-call firefighting review, which is running throughout the lifespan of the IRMP. Um, it's really pleasing to report to members that there's been excellent progress here. So we already now uh, flexibly mobilise uh, or can flexibly mobilise our on-call uh, fire engines. Uh, uh, and what that means is if there is a fire engine at a station where there's only two firefighters available, uh, previously that fire engine would not have been available for a fire call. What we can do now is match that fire engine up with another fire engine with only two people available at another on-call station, pair them up together to produce one asset that we can then mobilise to incidents. And we've used that on numerous occasions over the last year to enhance appliance availability. We've also issued all of our on-call firefighters new alerters um, uh, and new contracts and recruitment are proceeding. One of the um, most exciting parts is around employee supported firefighting. Uh, and that's enabling our on-call firefighters to perhaps provide cover when they're at work from a local on-call station rather than needing to live nearby. Uh, so because of the, the significant changes in uh, work patterns because of COVID, more people are working from home and therefore possibly could provide that cover during the day. Um, the initial way we're rolling this out is to HCC employees. So we've got um, around about 8,000 people that we going to roll that out to HCC. What we'd like to see is those staff signing up to provide uh, fire cover during the day uh, and they can use uh, our fire stations to work from remotely whilst they do so. So that's ongoing. Uh, there's two uh, on-call firefighter recruitment courses that are uh, occurring this year. Um, the final part for on-call review is just a consideration around managerial structures. Uh, on-call firefighters are incredibly important to us in the service. They're half of our workforce. Uh, so part of the work around the uh, reference before managerial positions for our station and group commanders is to look at um, establishing some form of formal on-call managerial structure to offer them enhanced managerial support. So that's a quick run through of progress against the IRMP. The, the summary is that we are making really good progress. There's been really good outcomes. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Simon, thank you very much indeed. Just before I open it up for general questions, a very quick one from me. Um, in so we're procuring for the vehicles for a trial. That means we're buying them rather than leasing. What happens if the trial doesn't go um, in the way that perhaps you'd like it to go? You're then bought the vehicles. Yeah, it's absolutely. So the first, so break that down into the two vehicles. Uh, the first, the one, the fire engine at Berkhamstead, uh, as I mentioned, that is almost the same as a normal fire engine. Uh, so if we don't proceed eventually to then mainstream that into our fleet, that can be placed at training school and be used as a training appliance because it has the same physical pump that provides the water to the firefighters. So we can use it in that way. The other vehicle at uh, Watford, that is um, uh, a, a risk that the service is um, willing to take financially to understand if provision of that vehicle will be suitable for the county. It costs much less than a standard fire engine. And therefore it's, it's a risk that we've judged is, uh, is an acceptable one to take. And see the chief is got yes um, again I, would, I, would, I will just allow the chief to come in before i go to members because he might wish to add to that thank you for that Sam. daryl yeah. thanks chairman yeah so really just to support as simon said the other aspect of it in terms of the risk with that that smaller vehicle is that we aren't the first service to to put one into service so there are they are already being used elsewhere the trial is not really to see whether the vehicle works but it's to see whether it works for hertfordshire so that's that's the main the main piece here. Great, thank you for that, Dale. Judy, Judy was first. Thank you. I put my hands up strangely, not knowing that we were going to cover these new sized vehicles um, to inquire about them, because to me, um, it may just be a strange thing that's been going on in my life. It seems like about a hundred years since we were politically debating the IRMP. Um, and having ferocious discussions about um, things like numbers of crew on crews, sizes of vehicles, etc. So I'm a bit kind of nonplussed and shocked 
um, but we haven't yet got to the point where we're using the smaller vehicle because my assumption is that we will at some point in the very near future need smaller vehicles in many places in the county not least in Hitchin North where it's really hard for for fire engines to get into many places given modern approaches to parking and modern approaches to the number of vehicles each household thinks it should have on our streets um, and so I suppose I'm a bit surprised that we haven't even started yet how long would it be to test, evaluate and realise that we actually need a plethora of small vehicles all over the county, if indeed it turns out that we do, which I'm sure we will? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, I, I think it's a fair question and I think your assessment of having a mixed fleet is is probably correct actually uh, what we're realizing is a one size fits all is probably not suitable uh, these days actually we wouldn't ever want to have only small ones or only big ones and i think the mixed fleet gives us that capability to move things around um the, the answer to the delays um you know a significant portion of that has been in, in the last 18 months because of covid um we will hopefully have the the vehicle towards the end of this year it will then be a year's trial and uh, one of the the key parts is to ensure staff engagement so that they give us honest feedback about the vehicle's performance um, because we really want to understand how it works for them as well so how long would it take to get more sorry morris sorry, to, to sorry. sorry boss go on so it um council it it'll give you a bit of reassurance i think so firstly i, I think as uh, simon has said uh the prep for the trial needs to be good otherwise we we won't end up with a good evaluation so i think we the prep is the bit that's taken a long while as as simon has said covid has had an impact on the actual manufacturer uh, because we couldn't even order a vehicle uh for for some parts of last year Right. Um, the other the other part to, th to bear in mind, uh, which I'm sure, uh, Councillor Billing, you, you'll recall, we actually order four large fire, fire engines every year at the moment. That's our, our steady beats replacement programme. So that's a million pounds worth of fire engines every year. These ones being cheaper and smaller, uh, we would potentially be able to buy more going forward. So that would have a, have a financial benefit for the authority. But it could be that we could continue to condense the, the replacement program to get more of those small vehicles, as you said, more quickly. So um, it wouldn't get the whole refl fleet replaced in, in you know, in, in uh, sort of two years, but it would get it replaced more quickly. I think the other bit to bear in mind is, and, and I'll give a professional view here, that, that we will not have a fleet that is entirely based on one size of vehicle going forward. That means that we're likely to have some of the uh, larger fire engines we've got still in our fleet uh, for some considerable time, if not forever. The smaller vehicles, particularly the very small ones, I think are very much focused on town centre environment. So if we ended up with three or four of those, I'd actually be quite surprised, actually. Uh, I think probably one or two is more likely for Hertfordshire, maybe three. Um, so it really is the focus is really on that mid-sized vehicle that's going to be trialled at Berkhamsted. I actually think that might become the mainstay of the fleet in the long term. Um, and uh, that, that will be a key part of our focus going forwards. Um, but as I mentioned, we'll be able to do a replacement programme that allows us to get the right number of vehicles in place quite quickly. Um, so hopefully that gives you the reassurance, Councillor Billing, that, you know, particularly places like Hitchin, which I think, you know, would be a key focus, understandably, of yours. It would take virtually no time at all to ensure that Hitchin has the right resources. And given that Hitchin has two fire engines, I wouldn't expect them both to be either small, medium or large. I would expect them to be a mix of, of the, the ones that work best for that area. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you very much, Daryl. Thank be nice much. today because I know it's your last meeting. <laughs> Don't be nice to me. <laughs> thank, thank you, thank you very, very much. And also when, you, when you do a trial of anything, I think we all know it's good that you trial for what is effectively four seasons a year to see how things react depending on the weather circumstances and so on. So I think um, it, it's it's a, it's a good a good way to trial. Um, all right, I've got John Hale next, and then Fiona. So John first. Uh, thank you, Morris. Um, I've got three aspects I wanted just to, to ask about. One is on the on-call firefighting, 
Um, if I remember correctly, about this time last year, you discovered that because people were working from home, they actually had greater availability to do on call because they weren't commuting. And so you got their travel time, they were available. Um, is that now, aren't people, are you, some of your on-call firefighters now going back to where they're having to commute for an hour and you're seeing a reduction in their availability, or is this being offset by your recruitment program? Um, and then on the JESA, have we had any commitment from the Police and Crime Commissioner to, to towards the funding? I know there's been a lot of discussion about this, or I, or I understand there's been a lot of discussion about this, um, but I'm not sure if he's given much of a commitment yet towards um, the funding. Um, and actually, Morris, uh, for for a, another time, I think um, a report on what the Emergency Services Collaboration Board is doing would be useful. Yeah. And then finally, I assume we will at a future meeting this year uh, get the timetable for the next iteration of the IRMP because uh, presumably the planning for that should be about to begin. So sorry to fire off three questions there. Uh, Simon, can you do those? So yes, so the last question first, you're, you're absolutely correct, Councillor Hale, um, the timetable for that will, we start to thinking about that now and, and the, some of the recommendations in the fire cover review are going to feed into what the next IRMP will, will propose to do uh, around some of the capabilities and provision. Um, to answer your on-call firefighter question, yes, there was an uptick in uh, availability uh, throughout the pandemic. It has started to drop off slightly. Um, the recruitment courses uh, for on-call firefighters will hope to mitigate that, as will the different um, the different contracts and flexibility that we're hoping to offer, which will make uh, on-call firefighting more attractive. Is that all? Adele, did you want to just briefly, briefly interject? Uh, just to add to, to the, the question about the Joint Emergency Services Academy, um, so has the, the PCC made a commitment? Um, in principle, yes, the same as HCC. So I think it's important to bear in mind that we're only at the initial stage in the sense that the uh, County Council has committed the £600,000 to get us to the full outline case uh, or the full business case and towards the tender process. Um, that, that when we get to the point where we've got that case, then that will be the point at which we'll be formally requesting fire authority sign up to the Joint Emergency Services Academy, which is where the, the sort of £30 million plus the £5 million contingency that's in the uh, IP comes into play. And so we aren't, we aren't approved to spend that £30 plus million pounds yet. And at that same point, the PCC will be asked to um, uh, ensure his commitment and his part of that, which is, uh, you know, a significant number of millions of pounds as well. Um, so in effect, he signed, he signed up in principle and as it is going with that first stage, and then it will be for both the authority and the PCC to make a formal approval of it, um, which will be towards the end of this year. So hopefully that answer counsels, answers Councillor Hale's question. Uh, I'm glad you've got it in principle because my understanding was it wasn't in his budget yet. But in, in principle is always a good start, John. We'll um, hold his feet to the fire, mate. We'll hold his feet to the fire, um, if you'll pardon the analogy. Right, um, Fiona. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I'm conscious that several of the proposals could be quite controversial, particularly when they are more in the public domain. Um, people may not understand the rationale behind some of the changes. And yet I note was at 4.14, there's a very small section on engagement or communication. And I suppose a suggestion would be, should <laughs> there not be more about communications, um, perhaps even as a communications implication, you know, similar to at the end of the report where you have equality implications, financial, et cetera. Because I think it's very important to get the right messaging out. And as we all know, if if it's not being addressed, then there people can often jump to their own conclusions, which would be a shame. I think that's more of a co comment and suggestion in the question, isn't it, Fiona? Oh yes, absolutely. Thank you. Great. I hope, guys, if you'll, um, I hope you'll take that on board. I think communication is a very important one. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, thanks for that, Fiona. I'm not seeing any other hands, so um, we're going to move over then to uh, the recommendation, which is that we are asked 
as a panel to note the contents of this report. Again, very full report, lots of details coming forward. I don't think they're just bringing it forward because it's the first meeting and they're trying to find people who are not quite sure, found their feet yet, and try and get it all past us. This stuff has been going on for some time and uh, we're, we're, we've got Judy and John and others testing just to make sure. So um, I am grateful. It's a great report as well. Thank you for that, Simon. So um, if we can just go into the chat bar and if you're happy to note the report, Port, please say so. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Before we move uh, on to the public health matter, because we've now come to the end of the uh, the, the fire safety and the, and the, and the fire service. Um, Daryl, as you know, because it's been already flagged up, um, that our chief fire officer uh and director of community protection is retiring he's not shy but he is retiring and this is his uh his last panel meeting um he's also chaired the um scg the strategic coordinating group of the local resilience forum through the pandemic i know he's been in this role in this position for, uh, in this area for 10 years in Hertfordshire. um i think many of us will have worked with him in the past and it was always a privilege to do so and you can just see from the input that he's had today um, what a great uh, uh, knowledge that he has, and it will indeed be big shoes to fill. Um, I know we've made a very good appointment um, for the new fire officer, but um, Dal, um, you leave the... Um, my mantra is you leave something in a better condition than that in which you found it, and I have no doubt um, that after all your years at Hertfordshire, you have left our fire service in a better condition than that in which you found it. So I'm grateful to you for that. I'm sure the panel and the council is... And I do hope that you uh, enjoy your retirement. Please, God, at your age, you've got plenty of time to enjoy it. <laughs> and uh, we, we will miss you. Don't be a stranger. I'll allow John Hale a quick comment. I just wanted to echo all of your comments, Morris, and say I've enjoyed working with you, Daryl, over the last four years. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Daryl. Thank, okay. thank you very much, Chairman. Really appreciate thank that. You. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, indeed. So we're now going to move over. Um, to a brief, I uh, underline a brief overview of public health and statutory responsibilities. Hot foot from Radio 4 and, uh, can, and on, the, on the BBC News channel as we speak is, is our head of, uh, uh, of public health here, uh, Jim McManus. How's that for a build up? <laughs> I'm very grateful, Chair. Thank you. Um, and I, I echo entirely you. Comments about Daryl. I, I think it, um, I will miss him hugely as a colleague. Um, the purpose of this report is really, I know it says brief and it's 24 pages, it's intended as a bit of a rough guide um, uh, for members to keep with them as an introduction to the panel. And because this is the first meeting and because public health is a very complex part of a very complex portfolio, um, we thought you might find this useful as a summary to guide you. My suggestion would be that you always go to the first um, diagram on paragraph 5.5, .5, where it talks about the three domains of public health, health improvement, health protection and service quality, and, our, and start from there. And actually, you won't go far wrong. And indeed, come and talk to us. When the County Council had its functions transferred on the 1st of April 2013, you had the responsibility of appointing a director of public health jointly with the Secretary of State for Health. You took on a number of legal responsibilities that are outlined in the report and that I'm, I'm sure you're extremely grateful. I won't go through in detail, um, but they are there for you to read uh, and ask questions on. And I'm very happy to have a personal briefing with any member who would like that um, to take them through responsibilities. Um, we have a number of responsibilities that in short mean we touch the lives of every resident of Hertfordshire at multiple points um, from conception to death. And I won't go through that. But, you know, every child in Hertfordshire in Hertfordshire schools gets an eyesight test and a hearing test. Thanks to us. That's crucial. Um, and that's one of the things that um, this portfolio oversees. I won't go in, in, into any more detail or indeed repeat the uh, learning from this morning's um, panel induction. Our staff are above a certain level regulated. We have to be on a public health register. We have to meet the standards for professional practice that are set by the Faculty of Public Health, which is a joint faculty of the three medical 
uh, three Royal Colleges of Physicians of the UK, Glasgow, Edinburgh and London. Uh, so we have to meet those standards and we are accountable both to the County Council and to the Medical Royal Colleges and ultimately um, professionally accountable to you as councillors and to the Chief Medical Officer. Um, Appendix 1 has detailed uh, information on some of our responsibilities. There is a further detailed section on quality, which I won't go through, but that gives you a quality framework. Appendix 2 talks about the healthcare public health function, which is our duty to provide advice and guidance to the NHS. But we don't just provide advice and guidance to the NHS. We provide advice and guidance right across the council and indeed to many voluntary organisations through our free evaluation and evidence uh, services and indeed to the police and crime commissioner um, and other statutory bodies. Um, we don't privilege our NHS colleagues for our advice, but we do take our duty to support the NHS very seriously. But we are in a changing landscape. And so the work that we do with the NHS is changing in terms of uh, integrated um, care systems. And that will mean we will be doing more with the NHS, not less, but we will be doing different things. And the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment, which the Chair read out as part of his introduction to the portfolio, is just one of the things that we do for the system. Finally, um, in 2018, in, and it's covered in Appendix 3, um, the LGA came in and did a peer review of us, which is the kind of pinnacle, if you like, of um, uh, sector-led improvement, our own uh, approach. And we asked them the question, how well is the County Council becoming a public health organisation? And how well is public health serving the County Council in its ability to do so? And the answer to both, as some of you will remember, was um, very well, but obviously you've got more work to do. We haven't forgotten that agenda even through the pandemic. Um, uh, and even though our portfolio uh, size has grown from 50 million to just under 80 million during the pandemic, we are still working on this. The final thing I would say is that we we live, hopefully, the team of teams ethos. So quite a lot of what we do across the council, we pump uh, just under seven million into joint working across other services we, um, inside the county council. And we pump um, quite a lot of money into um, partnerships with others. Most of our services are commissioned out. Partnership is in our DNA. So for those of you who sit on district councils as well, we cannot do our work without our district council colleagues. Um, and I'll finish there, if I may, Chair, because um, I think the report is there as a guide, not as an exhaustive description. I'm grateful. I'm great. I'm grateful, Jim. And um, for those people again who are watching this, who may not be members, um, who think that there's a huge report and we haven't necessarily had a huge discussion, um, I think Jim mentioned it earlier about a panel induction. So this panel had uh, two and a half hours of induction this morning, as it was the first time we were meeting, uh, in which we had a fire safety, and also Jim was presenting to us uh, very much along the lines of what we're seeing now. So the report that members of the public and press and so on get an opportunity to see, as all members, which is in front of us, um, we don't rush through these things. We really do have, uh, uh, we do get taken through them by officers who are always available for us. And it's also worth adding, uh, what astonishing work that our public health people have been doing during the last 15 months. I've sat, uh, well, it's now fortnightly, but it was weekly meetings for the first year, uh, every week with leaders of all the bars and districts, leader of the county council, with Jim, our public health people, um, just to work out how we were going to move everything forward and work with each other uh, as we could to get our people as uh, safe as they can, get, uh, get us out of COVID as quickly as possible as well. So um, there's a lot of work that's been going on behind the scenes again, uh, and I know that we're all grateful. I've got a couple of people who want to speak. I've got Judy Billings first. Thank you, Chair. And uh, apologies that I wasn't able to join you for the induction session this morning. And I'll try not to embarrass myself by um, asking questions that I should have asked there. Um, I think an enormous amount has happened since you had the peer review. And I'm referring now to Appendix 3, the LGA peer challenge and I will declare an interest because it is part of my role um, on the improvement and innovation board at the LGA to try and make councils have more and more peer reviews all the time but I do wonder whether after the number of changes that we've all been through and your service 
possibly more than anybody in the world has been through in the last four years. Um, I think it was 2017, the peer review, whether you would consider um, maybe after five years, which would be next year, um, going through that process again, just to make sure that, that, that what well, I mean, I know you're sure because you do all these national things as well. So I'm not trying to sound impertinent. But a peer review is always a useful thing, a challenge to go back. And I just wonder whether there is any plan afoot to revisit that possibility, maybe next year or the year after. Again, with due deference to you, Jim, I'm not saying that you don't know what you're doing, mate, honestly. It's a suggestion, Jim. It doesn't. Uh, any thoughts? Um, I think it's always good to be open to external scrutiny. Um, and I think it's always good to have someone looking for you at things that you may not see. And um, if you look at the quality section of the report, um, there's multiple quality strands. Um, I have never not found an external visit helpful. So as a principle, I'm always open to come up, someone coming in and looking outside at us. And if members think that's a good idea, then I would be delighted to facilitate that. I, I would suggest, thank you. I would suggest it happens at a time when uh, we're, we're developing strategies still, and I think they're obviously evolving living documents, particularly because of what's been going on. I think we need to get to the next stage to understand what's happened in the last year or two to help us strategize moving forward. And then I think it's appropriate to some, say to someone, right, have a look. What's your experience of other people doing the same elsewhere? So we can continue the process of learning. So I think it's a very valid suggestion, and I think it should be part of a timetable uh, for the next couple of years. Thank you for that. Uh, Judy. Um, I've got Ron Tyndall next. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Jim, um, I realise, of course, we've all, there's going to be a huge agenda for everybody going forward, but I note on, at, uh, on item 6.7 on page 168, the mention of public mental health and suicide prevention. And I just wonder, uh, although it's mainly a health uh, service issue mental health uh, I just wonder whether or not it's possible that we, we could have a report uh, uh, an early meeting in the future simply because I I think the issue of mental health coming out of 18 months of Covid is likely to be uh, right across the county and across the country and, and and one of the major issues which is going to debilitate everybody and if we put that together with the situation with primary care networks, which uh, rumour has it are, are struggling, uh, it does uh, it does paint a gloomy picture going forward. So I wonder whether or not this committee could, uh, this panel could actually have a, a report on the situation as far as mental health in the county is concerned going forward, uh, what services there are and how, uh, how the uh, the strain on the services are going to be handled. Another very useful suggestion, Jim, I think. I agree, Chair. I mean, I, I, we'd be delighted. We've done quite a lot of public mental health work during the pandemic. So, for example, the work on preventing post-traumatic stress in care home workers was funded by public health. Um, there's a huge amount of work going on uh, and we'd be delighted to um, take that as an action point if, mem if you'd like uh, that. I have no doubt that all members will have heard or have witnessed from both residents and the work that they've been doing of issues around uh, mental health and, it, and its exacerbation. I mean, it was a problem before, but now hugely exacerbated by what's been going, been going on. And I think explanations, uh, you know, documents that help us understand a more about it and be what we can do and signpost our people when they get in touch would be very helpful. So thank you for that, Ron. Great, great suggestion. Colette and then Sunny. So I've got Colette first. Right, thank you. Jim, I, I, I was also looking at the um, LGA peer review and my, my comments are a, a little bit like Judy's, but not the same. And and I read through the, the recommendations to work on. And, and, and frankly, it was almost like a, a bit of a tap on the wrist. They couldn't find anything really wrong. However, the landscape has has moved on um, since then. I think it would be good, as others have said, that we revisit okay. and get further advice. But I would hate um, 
the next iteration of that advice to look at this and say, well, they haven't done anything about that and immediately, um, you know, the, the recommendations and immediately mark us down. And I think that it has to be framed within the context of what we've all been through with COVID, uh, which has it impacted and as, as well as the, the changes that are going on now with, with the relationship with the NHS itself. Um, so, so yeah, so I'm, I think the, the you know, the, um, the document was a very good one, very useful. Uh, and I should put it beside my bed every night. Not. Um, but um, but uh, yeah, so, really... I'm sure William, your husband, will be well relieved at that. <laughs> He'll be yeah. asleep. <laughs> <laughs> so will you, if you read it. Um, no, that's, that's really helpful. Jim, Jim your thoughts? Um, I, I, I'm sure this report will come for some as a cure for insomnia. Um, uh, and um, that's great if it helps people get a good night's sleep. Um, I, again, I think so far panel members chair are in complete agreement that it would be a good idea to do this. And I think why would we not want that kind of level of external assurance? It's probably also useful at this point to mention that there is a there is an organism called the Local Outbreak Member Board, which is the board of all, uh, of elected members that oversees the outbreak work um, for COVID, and our chair sits on that. And they, we've also put a proposal to them that when COVID um, is finally um, on its way out, we should actually do a lesson learned review of COVID as well. So um, uh, it's a both and, I think. So I'd be delighted to um, facilitate that. Jim, I should imagine that the latter there would be part of a, of a national invest look at uh, COVID and pandemics and so on. We wouldn't want to necessarily do one um, that's not part of a, of a bigger picture, would we? No, I don't think we would. But um, one of the things we did do is is we got a very when we did the surge testing in Broxbourne, we yeah. got a very rapid review of lessons learned, which basically gave us a playbook for doing the next one. And um, it's that kind of thing of you need to get in quick and say, right, what did you do that was really good before we all forget and move on to the next thing? But you're absolutely right. We wouldn't want to do a kind of belt and braces review um, separate from the national one. It, it would purely be up. What did we learn that we want to keep hold of going for the future? And the big thing, of course, is the partnerships. Colette, did you want to come back on that? Just, just very quickly, I, I do think it's really important that we look at how, how what we did and the effects were in Hertfordshire because that's where we're going to be applying the lessons we, we learn. There will be an, um, an, a national um, uh, viewpoint as well, but I think we really do need to think about what went well in Hertfordshire, what didn't, but use it as a guideline, not as a template, because whatever comes along next, it's not going to be exactly the same, but clearly there is some underlying learning um, that could be done. Thank you, Morris. Thank you. Um, Sana, you are next. Uh, thank you, Morris. Uh, thank you, Jim. Um, we spoke uh, earlier today about the ICSs. Uh, just had a quick question uh, with all the reconfiguration. Obviously, quite a lot of public health financing comes through commissioning. Um, will it continue to have a commissioning type funding or will it be more contract based from NHSE or NHSI or whatever uh, it will? Because I assume CCGs are going to be rolled up. Um, so the commissioning profile is going to change, I assume. Um, I think the commissioning profile will change, but if you look at the, the how, if you take what could broadly be described as public health, there's three chunks to commissioning. There's there's what the county council does with its public health budget, which we have a commissioning team inside, and um, we've worked hard to kind of improve outcomes and get value for money. Uh, but I mean, obviously, you, you folks can be the judge of that. Um, the second pot is. NHS CCG money where they choose to co-commission things with us, like, for example, weight management for uh, services. Um, and the intention is that that will continue because it's serving local people and will be whether it will be done by the uh, the integrated care system at, at the, the total level or these integrated um, care partnerships at more local level. We don't know yet because it's still up in the air. There is a third pot of money which currently sits with NHS England to commission things like um, prison health care that's in their bag. And um, we don't know, we had expected that to be devolved to local NHS systems, the ICS, 
it hasn't been and we have no idea if it will be so i think it's one of these things as ever with great big nhs reorganizations um there's an awful lot still up in the air Stanley? Oh, thanks jim a uh, quick question with regards to the the third one that you said nhs england are you talking about specialist commissioning or um, is that a separate branch no the, so the specialist commissioning which is things like very rare diseases and um a whole lot of other things but um, the NHS England Public Health Commissioning is done under a thing called Section 7A of the Health and Social Care Act, which is where the Secretary of State, basically the Secretary of State says to local authorities, you will commission this lot, and that's outlined in Appendix 1 of the report, and says to NHS England, you commission that lot. And it's things like prison health, um, certain types of vaccinations, um, hepatitis C treatment, Although we have prevention, they have treatment, and that's how the division works. And we don't know whether that will stay there or whether that will get devolved to the local NHS. Obviously, directors of public health have views about the, the more local things are, the better we can address needs, but that may or may not happen. Sonny, is that all right? That's brilliant. Thank you, Jim. Great. Um, thank you. I'm really delighted you're on this particular panel um, um, with your with your skill set. That's really great. Thank you. Um, colleagues, um, I'm not seeing anyone else. Um, and so we're having a look at the recommendations. We are asked to note and comment that on, from the contents of this report. But we've certainly commented on it and note that a new public health strategy needs Ch to be developed. And Chairman, sorry, Sonny, he's got his hand up. No, that was that's a. Uh... Sonny, did you still want to come back? No, it was a, it was a heritage. No, it was a. It was a hanging chad, sorry. Yeah, it was a hanging chad. Apologies, apologies, Chairman. Don't worry. No, I was keeping an eye on it. OK, um, so we're noting and commenting the content in this report. We're also noting, noting that a new public health strategy needs to be developed and progress is in its early stages. Um, if you can put, uh, if you're happy to note that in that way, please can you put noted in the chat? Sorry, Chair. Uh, Maurice, uh, Will note be made of the desire for us to have yes. an action yes. point on mental health? Yes, yes. it will be part of it. It will be in the minutes what we've agreed. We've agreed that we want to bring these things forward. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, and Jim is nodding. So thank you. Yes, we will do Thanks that. Yeah, thank you. OK, colleagues, so we move on to the uh, final item on the agenda. Item nine, the COVID situation update. Uh, and this is with you, Jim. Um, thank you, Chair. So uh, again, I will. I will try and give you a flavour of the headlines and the complexity without going on too long um, uh, and I shall share my screen. So um, I'll start by giving you a bit of an overview of uh, where we are. So in Hertfordshire we have a thing called the local... Firstly, can I ask if you can all see that because I can't see you anymore. Can you see that in good enough size? Yes. 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 Thank you. Um, so in Hertfordshire, we have, uh, like every area, an outbreak plan, and it's at hertfordshire.gov.uk outbreak plan. It's um, managed by the Health Protection Board, um, which um, I chair, which is a, a board with uh, all the relevant agencies on it. Um, and we are a team of teams, and it is overseen by a board of the 11 leaders of the councils, um, our chair Morris uh, and the police and crime commissioner and someone from the NHS so you can read that very happy to give you a detailed briefing on it and there are quite a lot of work streams in there. Um, <clears throat> our summary dashboard for the last week or two shows that um, we have seen some rises in cases all across Hertfordshire up with one or two falls so you can see that actually if you look at Watford it has gone up uh, quite substantially and has dropped back down again by dint of the multi-agency action plan that we put in place in Watford um, to curb the rise. You can also see Three Rivers as rising, but that so a number of areas are showing the same pattern, but we are putting in place the same actions to try and reduce the curb. What this tells us is that we continue to be in a very volatile time of infections. Um, it also tells us that um, the new Delta variant is now the dominant strain as we expected it would be. So we will have to put every effort into trying to suppress 
rises of infection if we want to keep um, our businesses, our schools, our leisure and so on operating safely and infections down. I would just say that at the time of writing, uh, time of speaking, we have fewer than seven people in hospital in Hertfordshire. <laughs> um, so that's a, a good thing, very different from the last search. The virus shows no sign of doing anything other than what it's doing, which is creating new variants. Um, there's no sign that the virus has developed a very transmissible, but far more pathologically milder form of infection. Uh, 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 so we haven't got a mild flu-like version yet, which I think we're all hoping for. Um, equally, vaccines aren't 100% effective at stopping transmission, but they do reduce it and they do uh, stop people getting ill. They are breaking the link between infection and serious illness for the most part of the 223 people in hospital in England today, most of them uh, had had either no doses of vaccine or only one dose of vaccine and only 20 had been fully vaccinated. So that I think is 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 a good sign. I wish it were better, but we can't just go back into lockdown. So we are left with an NHS under massive non-COVID pressure that we need to try to avoid having it under massive COVID pressure and significant volatility. If we look at the government's four tests, um, uh, the four tests as of the last time they were assessed were that the vaccine deployment programme continues successfully both nationally and in Hertfordshire, that is the case. There are inequalities, but we have detailed plans to reduce them. And in Hertfordshire, we're spending over a million uh, on uh, improving access to vaccination. The, evidence, the second test is that the evidence shows the vaccines are sufficiently effective. Even with the Delta variant, and forgive me for calling that the Indian variant there, that's a, 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 an old slide, uh, when that was written, even with the Delta variant, that remains the case. The vaccine may be reduced in effectiveness, but it still works well enough and it works far better than the flu vaccine. Um, the third is that infection rates don't pose, don't risk a surge in hospitalizations. At the minute we're green, but if infections continue to rise exponentially, we may see that change because if enough get, people get infected, enough people will be admitted. The fourth one, is that the assessment of the risks is not fundamentally changed by new variants of concern. Well, what we know is that we have to work a lot harder to stop this new variant transmitting, but so far in Hertfordshire, our efforts seem to have worked. Um, it is always possible, like uh, other variants, we could be overwhelmed, but so far things are working. And so far our residents are doing a great job um, our local Hertfordshire test is our vaccine uptake that we want um, to reduce the gap um, between eligible populations uh, to less than 15 percentage points between those high, with highest uptake and those with lowest uptake. In other words, we'd quite like to have the lowest gap in the country <laughs> between eligible groups. We're not there yet, but we have reduced it. Um, our widest gap was about 25%, which is far less than London. Um, so uh, our aim is to have the narrowest gap in the country if we can manage it. I know it's a stretch, but if we're not ambitious, well, we shouldn't try if we're not going to try and be ambitious. Um, the question then is, is there a COVID end game? We can't alter the virus. Elimination, which is the permanent reduction to zero COVID, is just not feasible at this present time. Um, eradication, which is effectively suppressing the virus to very low levels, may be. But before we get there, actually, we have to do this in stages. And there's no silver bullet. There's no single thing. It's an accumulation of multiple small steps, each of which is imperfect, but which add up in combination to prevent and suppress. You may have heard that called the Swiss cheese defence. Uh, and that Swiss cheese defence is uh, face covering, plus social distancing, plus do things outdoors, plus ventilation, plus reduce your risk, plus get both doses of the vaccine if you are eligible. And if we do that and everybody does that and everybody tests regularly when they socialise and they self-isolate, 
we will suppress these numbers. We know these things work because they've worked for the last 15 months when people have done them consistently. So our first step is to make COVID a manageable infection. Um, we've done that with HIV. I know it's a different route of transmission and a different virus. But if we can improve the survival rate for people who are, um, who do become symptomatic even more, and that's partly vaccines, it's partly therapeutics, we will help make this a manageable infection. If we keep numbers low and keep new variants away as much as possible, then we will contribute to that and that will be an important step on the way to low COVID. So keeping COVID as manageable, plus trying to keep aspects of the county open is our immediate strategy, I think, for now. Um, we can be certain that effective isolation of people with illness who test positive um, will reduce numbers. We can be certain that effective home testing a week and isolation works. We can be certain that increasing the portion of the population doubly vaccinated will reduce symptomatic disease and will reduce but not stop transmission. And we can be certain that if people likely to get serious illness get vaccinated, it reduces the chance of them being in hospital and onward spread. And I think that bullet point there is a wee bit garbled. Um, so there are things we can do. Conversely, there are things that will make this episode worse. Ignoring symptoms and not isolating, a lack of testing, unmasking in a poorly ventilated crowded area and the delays in vaccine coverage. So there is no end in sight to the kind of public health response to this. We are going to be, I think, responding to COVID as well as uh, doing other non-COVID work, as well as COVID recovery work like mental health work over the next year. But we are determined to get there and continue to get there. For the sake of time, I don't intend to go in detail through dashboard views unless members ask a particular question, but I have the dashboards already should you wish to see particular performance against different areas. Um, and Chair, I'll stop there and happy to answer any question uh, anyone should uh, want to ask. Great, thank, thank you very thank much you. indeed for that. Uh, Jim, I'm just I'm waiting for you to well, um, yeah, you might want to come out of that. And then if anyone, if you need to go back in again, then it's easier to see. Uh, Sonny is first to speak on this. I'm just trying to uh, stop sharing my screen and it seems to ah, be okay. misbehaving itself, Chair. I do apologise. OK, um, give us a second then, Sonny. Hold on. There we are. Ah, yeah, over to you, Sonny. Uh, thanks, Morris. And as always, thank you, Jim. I've actually, uh, I don't know whether it was your slide, but I have uh, taken... Uh, your Swiss cheese one and shown it around my hospital quite a bit. Um, I, I, so I, we happen to have done our query wave three planning yesterday and from a secondary care point of view and obviously we were sort of the message coming across was being doubly vaccinated. Yes, it doesn't <clears throat> protect you 100 percent, but it does improve your chances of hospitalization and that's what secondary care uh, worry about more than anything else. But it also struck me that there seems to be a pretty big increase in admissions via A&E to hospital, more so in the last three months than before. And these are non-COVID related issues. In your opinion, is that going to affect the public health side for us? Um, I think the short answer is yes, because you have um you may have heard me bang on about syndemics not pandemics um the idea that covid isn't a pandemic it's a it's a collection of waves of different things and um there was a lot of healthcare need that was displaced by people needing hospitalization in, in during covid waves otherwise they die which is one of the reasons we want we, one of the reasons we want to avoid lots of people with covid in hospital is because it displaces people who haven't got covid um, and that's now coming back up. So things like cancer treatment. But you've also seen the deterioration of people who could have had preventive health care, but couldn't because of COVID. Um, we just haven't had an NHS that's been able to treat every single person in the country for everything because no country in the world would have. 
So that will, I think, affect the health of the population in general in terms of our burden of disease. Um, and it will affect everybody. Uh, um, I think it will affect us in some ways less because of just the nature of the county of Hertfordshire, but it will affect different populations differently. I think the other thing we'll see is long COVID. So we, we know that we if we look at the epidemiological estimates, there are about 40,000 people in Hertfordshire who have enduring symptoms of COVID that may be neurological or heart problems or various other things. Um, that's a whole new hospital. Um, you know, it's it's 20 psychologists, it's um, four or five GP practices, which we haven't got. So I think there is no doubt that as we come out of this into recovery, we're going to have to plan for it. I don't have an answer, but I, 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 that I'm just outlining the picture of the challenge um, because you, you folks who've been in the front line in the NHS have had everything thrown at you from COVID and now you're having everything thrown at you from non-COVID. Uh, and I, I think people may not be seeing just the demand that's on our NHS. One thing we could do is increase the number of people in virtual COVID wards should we need to. So things like um, pulse oximetry, which is mo monitoring people's oxygen, that really, really worked during the second pandemic and stopped a lot of deaths. So the more we do that, I think the better going forward. Thank you, Jim. Uh, it's my kid arriving back from school. Uh, anyone else? Um, thank you for that, Sonny. Um, uh, Fiona. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Morris. Thank you, Jim. A quick question about the, the local hearts test. And I noticed on one of the slides you'd covered, um, obviously, <coughs> inequalities, refusal, logistics, and somehow contributing to delays in vaccine coverage. And I just wonder what's been done to combat each and all of those um, and how significant is the logistics issue? Affecting um, future? So, so the, I, I talk about four to four things that the big four that we need to sort for vaccines. The first is access and barriers. Um, uh, the second thing is um, people's hesitancy. Um, the third thing is data. And having good data and the fourth thing is misinformation so we've got really good data the issue is it's a confusing picture because um vaccine numbers are just well here's a total number of people vaccinated and it's not age standardized so you can't tell performance um 725,000 people have been vaccinated in Hertfordshire with first dose and 474,000 with the second dose that's really really good and if you look at it by cohort almost every cohort, so the age cohort, the UK JCVI cohorts, almost every cohort above the age of 40 has performance in the high 70s. But if you look at our Hertfordshire performance as a whole, it's about 56.9 um, uh, coverage compared to an England average of, of slightly higher, of a bit higher, about 70%. So you have to drill down really deeply down. So we now have a dashboard that can go down to ward level by ethnicity, by deprivation and pinpoint areas. That dashboard is now used by a joint team in the NHS and public health, which is Louise Savory from my team leads it. And we have funded um, pop-up clinics. We have, uh, I think we're on our 150th webinar for different communities. We've got 306 community champions who put out information in different languages. Um, we we nick Sonny's colleagues on a regular basis to go out and do vaccine clinics because I'm sure he's delighted about that. Um, hearts and bed Afro GPs are forever going out and doing clinics. We have nurses at present going around every social care worker in the in the county having an individual conversation with them about um, their, where they haven't been vaccinated and talking about risks and doing it very confidentially and supportively. Um, and uh, we have a whole lot of other measures. So there's an action plan in place and we have a series of walking clinics across the county. And I'm really pleased to announce that in Watford particularly, we will be having walking clinics with, with Moderna and Pfizer for the under 40s, which is where we need to have them. So, um, we will do whatever it takes to to do more and where there are ideas we'd love to hear from them 
I, and I have to say that this has been a partnership between all these councils, the NHS and local community groups. Um, so all ideas welcome uh, and we will try to turn them into action. I'm not saying it's wonderful, but over 90% of our people with learning disabilities have been vaccinated. We've reached 90% of our homeless people through our special homeless clinics. Um, our Irish traveller population has, has reached about 90%. It is some of our black and white and white mixed populations and some of our black British populations who have concerns because of their experience of vaccines as uh, in culturally in the past and their experience of the way doctors behaved many, many years ago. And we have to respect and work with that um, uh, uh, and, and deal with that genuinely. So we've got a job to do. But we're much better than lots of other areas. That's not good enough for me. Yeah, I concur. Whilst it's, not, whilst it's not a competition, it is important to know that we are performing as well as we can. And Hertfordshire is really punching above the weight. I mean, there's no doubt, as you say, the logistics of people working together across different agencies uh, is has been quite extraordinary. Um, and I think we, we shouldn't forget that. And it's not over yet. And there's people still very tired, working very hard. Um, any other comments at all? Um, I'm very grateful to, to particularly to Sonny and to Fiona there, but particularly to Sonny, it's good to have someone on the ground who can uh, be, be keep giving another another view as well and reinforcing uh, what Jim is saying and, and testing him with some good questions as well. So, colleagues, look, it's um, it's there's been a fair old agenda. We've got a lot of papers. Uh, Jim is always available to give you personal information for your own areas if that helps. But for as far as we're concerned, as this panel, we are obviously asked to to note and comment the. Con oh, Sunny, you, you wanted to come back in. Or just to set, just to tell Jim that uh, um, I've been kidnapped a couple of times to go and do some vaccinating. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's um, it's interesting because I had my I had my first vaccination a pharmacist in a private room, not a private room, but it was a room at the back. The second one was at the Adam Lane Community Centre. And as I'm queuing up there, they go, "Oh, hello, Morris." I mean, I've been lived here thirty years. Hello, Morris. Hello. And then you get up there, right? Shirt off because I was wearing a shirt. I shouldn't have worn a shirt. I should have worn a t-shirt. And you just this is like hundred people all in the same place, sticky, and off you go. But you have to be brave about it. No, I didn't get a sticker or anything. Um, but that was a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's going well. Thank you very much indeed, Jim, for everything you and your people are doing. Uh, as I've said, I've been involved with you guys now for 15 months. I'm, I'm astounded by the work that's been going on with the NHS and, and everyone behind it. Colleagues, we are asked to note a uh, comment, which we have done. We are asked to note Jim's COVID situation update. I'm sure he'll be bringing one of these for quite some time to come. Uh, if you can and are happy to note it, please now place oh you've done it already before i've even had a chance you put it in the chat file which i have now done also that's excellent colleagues thank you very much indeed and we move over now to item 10 any other part one business and that means in public business um there is no uh, any other part one business and there is also no part two no confidential matters that we need to discuss today we do try and where possible to keep as much in part one as we can but there is no more part one there is no more part two uh, i know it's been a long meeting a long day for those who uh, also managed to do the uh, induction this morning and um, i thank everyone for their attendance for their contribution to the meeting and to officers for all the work they're doing i look forward to seeing you all again at the next meeting which is scheduled I think it's on, on July the July is it July the eleventh? But it's yes. certainly it's uh, yes July the twelfth at ten a.m. Thank you everyone. Have a lovely weekend. Uh, thank you, Morris. Very thank well you. chaired, Morris. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. And thank, thank, you. thank you, Jim. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Have a lovely weekend. Good weekend.